Back in 1995, astronomers found the first planet orbiting a sun-like star outside the solar system. This star, 51 Pegasi, uh, was eventually found to host multiple planets. And over the ensuing years, uh, for the next five, five to eight years, most of the planets found were gas giants. And it was possible to make an argument, well, okay, we're going to find other planets like Jupiter and such, but there are probably no Earth-like rocky planets. Well. Uh, now that we've come 15 years, better than 15 years after that discovery, in fact, astronomers have found Earth-like planets, or planets that are similar in size to Earth, similar in density to Earth, uh, haven't found one necessarily that's orbiting out in a habitable zone yet, but nonetheless, astronomers are, a growing body of evidence indicates that there are a wealth of rocky planets out there. And I thought it was worth, I thought it would be worthwhile to kind of survey what does our solar system look like? What do planets in our system tell us about the expectation of finding life? And as we find out about these increasing number of rocky planets, and even some that are going to be in the habitable zone, some that may even have water on them, how do we think about them and how does that impact the Christian faith and whether uh, this is an, this uh, uh, is any sort of way an argument against the, the Christian God. Now, as we look at our solar system, one of the things that we see is that there are two classes of planets. There are the, the Jupiter gas giant type planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. These are gaseous planets. They have no solid surface on them. They exist in the outer part of the solar system. Uh, and then there are the four rocky inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And these are the planets that have a solid surface, uh, especially Venus, Earth, and Mars all started out with an abundance of water on them. Uh, Earth is the one that still has water remaining today. Uh, and we can measure the sizes, the densities, the, the, the constitution, the composition of these planets and get a great deal of information. Now as we begin to look out at planets outside our solar system, we ask the question, okay, how frequent or how common is it that we're going to find planets like Earth that are the same size, orbit in the same, uh, roughly the same region or around in the habitable zone, liquid water habitable zone around their stars. Well, some of the latest research, uh, you know, as we, as we begin to find these planets, we actually begin to find stuff that was Earth size uh, within the, uh, probably the past five years. One of those, uh, a, a, an, a planet called Corot 7b, we found, astronomers found, had a radius 80% larger than that of the Earth and a mass that was about five times that of the Earth, which gave it a density which was 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And, and how, for comparison, Earth's density is right at 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. I think it's, so it's very similar density. So it seems like we're beginning to find rocky planets. Now, uh, that along with a, another rocky planet was found, Kepler 10b, had a radius about 40% larger than that of the Earth. Again, had a mass just under five times that of the Earth and it had a density larger, about 8.8 .8 grams per cubic centimeter, which is density very similar to iron. Uh, but what's remarkable is that these were the first planets that we can confirm definitely had a rocky surface to them or had a surface that could be stood on. Uh, so they're similar to Earth in that fashion. Now both of these planets had temperatures well over uh, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are not remotely habitable planets. They're very close to their parent stars. But what it does say is that astronomers are developing the capabilities. This was demonstrating that astronomers had the capability to detect Earth-sized planets around stars that kind of looked like our sun. Now, as they begin to investigate and they continue to look and uh, advance the technologies, we've been able to find planets that are kind of Neptune-like uh, and even uh, smaller than Neptune's, things that are maybe 10 times the size of the Earth, and uh, planets that very much resemble or are kind of borderline on what would, what would happen to Earth if you just made it a little bit larger. And so astronomers are continuing to push closer and closer to find Earth-like planets. And the difficulty is, just the smaller the planet is, the harder it is to detect. But what they are able to do is to begin to ask, how many Jupiter-sized planets are there? How many Saturn-sized planets are there? How many Neptune-sized planets are there? How many super-Earths, those that are anywhere from one to 10 times the mass of the Earth? How many of these are there? And then kind of extrapolate down how many Earths are there? And what they find when they do the calculations of planets that we have detected, that we know are out there, we can conservatively estimate that there are probably somewhere around 160 billion planets in our galaxy alone. 
Now these are all going to be much larger than the Earth, anywhere from a few to a few times the mass of the Earth up to Jupiter type planets. But we also can say, all right, what does the trend say in how many Earth-like planets? And probably there are going to be as many Earth-like planets, if not more than that. So we could, we could have upwards of 400 billion planets in our galaxy. Now certainly some of those are going to orbit around sun-like stars. Some of those that are orbiting the sun-like stars are going to be at the right distance where liquid water could exist. And so does this say that life is going to be common in our galaxy, that we are just on the verge of finding planets where all the conditions for life are met, particularly water, and so we're going to find life? Well, what's interesting is that we can go look in more detail at those objects in our solar system and get an answer to that. When we study Venus and Mars in particular, those are two planets that are kind of on the borderline of the habitable zone around the sun, we see some kind of interesting results. We find that both of these planets started out with an abundance of water. Um, Mars almost certainly was covered in liquid water early in its history. Venus has a great deal of water, uh, but it's always had a pretty high temperature. And so when we go look at Venus, we find that it has a very heavy atmosphere, 40 times, the, 40 times that of Earth. It has a hot temperature. Uh, temperature, I think, is right around 800 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, contrasted with the you know, roughly uh, anywhere from 30 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit that exists on the Earth. It has no magnetic field, so in a, what has happened, because it has no magnetic field, is that the radiation and the wind that comes off from the sun has actually just evaporated and destroyed all of the water that was originally on Venus. Now if we go over and we look at Mars, we, all, we find some interesting scenarios as well because Mars has an abundance of evidence of liquid water in its past. Um, we, we find that uh, we've, when we put our rovers there, we dig things up that are very high pure concentrations of silica, which almost certainly were deposited in a liquid water environment. We find uh, the Phoenix rover when it was landed. It actually dug a, dug a scoop and it found these rocks that evaporated uh, just on the time scale that would be expected if they were actually made out of water ice. In fact, we've seen snow falling on Mars. But nonetheless, as we look in the detail at these planets, we find that though they may have started with liquid water, there were an abundance of things, or any number of things, caused the water to disappear and no longer be liquid. Uh, so we see evidence that these planets were like Earth in some fashion, but they ended up not like Earth. And in fact, that's interesting when you go and look at Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. In fact, Earth started covered in water, but nonetheless, it was not a habitable planet. It was hostile to life. It was only after God performed repeated miracles described in the Genesis account and in other places throughout Scripture, did Earth become habitable, not only filled with life, but teeming with life. So all of the evidence as we look at planets inside our solar system and as we discover the abundance of planets outside our solar system show us that Earth exhibits a remarkable ability, a remarkable capacity to support life four and a half billion years after its formation, that neither of its sister planets on either side, Venus or uh, Mars, ever exhibited. And that gives us the expectation that as we look out and find planets throughout our galaxy, that though we may find some that match Earth in similar characteristics, we'll find that none of them are going to meet all the requirements that are met here on Earth for abundant life. And that, again, points to a creator specifically fashioning Earth to, to host advanced life, particularly human life, like God did here on Earth.